So thank you so much for coming. Our uh, one of the first TS talks of the year. We we're very fortunate to have Kaina Gata in the region and to be able to come and talk to us about uh, some of the things he's thinking about. If uh, if you saw the uh, circulation going around, the email going around, uh, um, you'll maybe have gotten a bit of the backstory. Um, this summer. I had an epiphany while working as the Quebec City uh, Bureau Chief, uh, uh, the CTV, about corporate media and the problems of having to bite his tongue and so forth. And just wrote about, wrote about it on his blog when he quit his job. Little be known to him that blogging is a very powerful form of social media that goes by. He's the laugh at those social media those bloggers. <laughs> You just thought you were throwing a baseball into a vacuum, right? You thought I was never going to That's on Twitter. Those are the other Facebooks. Yeah, <laughs> next thing you know, uh, um, he finds himself in a new line of work. Uh, one aspect of which is traveling across the country, uh, telling people about difficulties with TV news and so forth. Uh, so it may be a little bit of the case of preaching to the converted today, uh, uh, but let's not let it be so easy for him. Uh, um, call, you know, we can support uh, uh, corporate hegemony, uh, right? Yeah, can we want to hurl abuse. Um, <laughs> great, because I'm not used to talking a lot. I just stare at the eye of Sauron every day, right? Yeah. Just looking a little and, and you just sort of sound off without people actually challenging your assertions. So that'd be cool if you guys want to interrupt or ask questions. You've heard it long from the horse's mouth. So yeah, without further ado. Uh, awesome. Uh, preaching to the converted is a problem that I realize I'm maybe going to run into. Um, I'm just curious, can I ask you guys how many people have a, a television? <laughs> okay. Are there people who watch, like, watch TV news? No. When you say you have a television, like I have a television, but I haven't had you know, Separate questions. Yeah. Separate, separate questions. questions. Yeah. 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 I also found a television on the boulevard the other day. I could claim it, but I don't watch <laughs> television. So, do people watch TV news, like, regularly? Three, four times? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I like, my job, so I did like, how do you define watching TV news? Like, I'll watch certain clips and channels. It's right, a right. Right. Maybe yeah. three or four times a week. Um, More of an on-demand thing, like yeah. what you're actually interested in. Or a specific news article that like draws my attention or gets linked to me for some reason or another. Okay. So clearly, when Brad told me I would be addressing a middle Canadian audience full of. Uh, Television fans misled me. Um, what were fans? So people, are we generally agreed that TV news could be better? Yeah, it is. Okay, so I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of crappy TV news. Um, we call the talk "Can We Salvage TV News?" which is a rhetorical question. Uh, I don't want to keep you in suspense. I don't think we can salvage TV news the way that it is set up right now. Um, but I think it's really important to draw a distinction between. TV news as an industry and video journalism, or visual journalism as a craft or as an institution, because of course, um, I do believe, and a lot of people accuse me uh, otherwise, but I, I believe that journalism is one of those pillars that holds the roof up of the democracy and it's something that has to be strong. The problem is right now that it's actually weakened itself as an institution in a way that I think makes it kind of dangerously, anyway, I'll get to that a little later. But um, the point is that I, I know, and I think you know, a lot of fantastic interviewers and writers and storytellers and videographers across Canada. It's not that there's a lack of talent or that there's somehow, you know, it's just that we're not attracting the right candidates, I think. And so I know a lot of people who walk away from these news organizations um, or who never joined in the first place who could be fantastic assets to Canadian journalism. And I know a lot of people who are still working inside these news organizations where I believe that their full potential might never be realized. So I just want to tell you a little bit about my uh, old boss at CTV. So this is uh, Kevin Krull, and I'm going to make fun of him a little bit, but I think he's a, he is genuinely a really fantastic guy. Uh, he's got lovely kids, he's running a marathon. He's uh, a corporate citizen with a vision for the future. And uh, yeah, so he's the CEO of Bell Media. So he's in charge of Discovery Channel and Bravo and Space and TSN and MTV and Much Music and a shitload of radio stations and CTV's up there and CTV News is right up there. So, is Kevin Crow uh, a former journalist? One would hope. He has the rugged good looks. The bone structure, you know, he comes from Nestle. So he comes to us from Ohio where for 10 years he sold Kit Kats and his coffee and carnations and milk and a whole bunch of other 
process crap. Here, you know? So according to prevailing market logic, there's no difference between this chocolate syrup and this chocolate syrup. Anytime we have a party, he gets on the piano and, um, you know, we have a drum set in the corner and guitars and so we're always doing that in our private life. That's what we do. That's what he does every night. He, she's very opinion, opinionated <laughs> about song selection. I will, I will tell you that much. Yeah. So there is an argument for why information has to be a commodity. And that's that if you can draw in enough viewers by whatever means and run enough ads, that you can pay for the journalism that actually strengthens the democracy, right? It's the spoonful of sugar argument, where I guess the sugar is uh, this kind of stuff, and the medicine would be uh, investigative journalism, the kind of stuff that holds decision makers to account, the kind of stuff that exposes lies, that takes down presidents, whatever the Bernstein, not TV reporters, but still. Um, and foreign coverage, this very, very expensive form of journalism that reminds us of our sheer humanity and our place in the world, our role and our responsibilities as Canadians. I mean, this is important stuff. And the other thing that I think uh, justifies the commodification of news is, is truly local news, that community level journalism that really builds neighborhoods and builds connections between people. Um, and those things, I think, if, if that was the bulk of what we're watching, you could very well argue would be worth sitting through all those ads. Maybe the format has to change a little bit in terms of on-demand video, that kind of stuff, but uh, they're all very worthwhile forms, I think, of television journalism. There's ways that you can use the medium very well to do all those things, but something clearly is wrong, and uh, I think it's just a case of, of too much uh, sugar and not enough medicine, I guess. So uh, I took a lot of heat for pointing this out to being 24, and then these guys in their 60s and 70s have spent whole careers actually confirmed that I'm not just walking into this and sort of declaring the whole institution to be corrupt, that they, that anyway, according to these guys who've worked there for 30 to 40 years, something actually has changed. That it's not just in our imaginations, that there's something that has gradually shifted and there's been a sort of hollowing out of this institution in the last 30 or 40 years. So that's what we're sort of trying to explore right now. This um, is what we now call investigative journalism. There are dozens of licensed businesses that have raunchy ads promising a lot more than your average massage. One of the more low-key ads in this adult online section belongs to KK Acupuncture in Richmond. With the help of our undercover volunteer and a hidden camera, we checked out what exactly was being offered. The sign at the store says traditional Chinese medicine. As soon as our man entered, the manager, Wendy, closed the door. He asked what kind of service he could get with his discount coupon and how much. Total, total 80 to 100? Okay, and uh, what can I get with that? I can give you traffic massage and a hand job. Okay, what is a hand job? It, do you do, is a hand job, what, what is it exactly? Is it just a... Is it masturbation? Any thoughts? Reflections? Some might call these times a gold rush. I'm just wondering how that strikes you. The way it's built, the way it's packaged, the way it's presented, and what you're actually seeing, I don't know if there's any immediate reaction. Like, the intro section makes it look like they're trying to make it look exactly like CSI or Cold Case or any of the, like, crime drama TV series um, that have come out of the last few years now. Mm, that's interesting. There, there, of course, there is a there's a malpractice issue here, right? There's an accountability issue because they're, as we find out later, after all of the hand job stuff, they're offering receipts, like you can write it off on your medical expenses. So I guess for that particular acupuncture plan, that's an issue. But this is part of something that I term consumer protection journalism, and I just want to show you another example from another CTV investigation, looking at a popular infomercial. Some might call these times a gold rush. The price of gold has soared, and it seems people want to cash in. Dollars for Gold will give you more cash for your gold than anyone else. That's our guarantee. It seems to me like most of us, Amanda O'Byrne saw this ad. It's appealing. They say that they, they have the highest payout, um, and if you're not satisfied, well, then they send the gold back, no questions asked. So she thought, why not? I sent uh, diamond, a diamond engagement ring, um, a band, a few silver items, an earring. 
She was hoping for good money. What she was offered surprised her. You expect a few hundred dollars for more than one item. And what was the offer? $21. Do you see the connection between those two pieces? Does anyone want to explore that? Oh, okay, so we're raising the projection, what you said. It's already towards the purchasing practices of the business industry. What about the effort to reward ratio? These are pretty easy stories to put together. Because it's just like running a trap line or putting a fish hook in the water, right? If you have a news organization, people are going to call you and say, I got ripped off, or I expected a hand job, I got something else. And you just go and put two or three days, right? These take two days to put together. And you run to ground and you have a seven minute special report about how dollars for gold is a rip off. Um, but the problem is that it doesn't actually examine any of these underlying cultural questions, like why do we send our money to strangers in the mail? Or why do we pay for sex? I mean, there's like legitimate questions that they could be exploring, um, but instead we're doing a form of journalism that's billed as sort of hard-hitting investigative reporting, but nothing changes. I mean, it doesn't point to any solutions, it doesn't point to any alternative models, it doesn't do anything beyond maybe move that acupuncture clinic down the block or stop people from mailing their money to dollars for gold. Yeah. How come it's easy for uh, a news reporter to go then and to critique KK, the acupuncture clinic, and to moralize that and to say you're doing something really bad? Because that's what they're doing. They're, they're saying that's so good. People are also doing yeah. really that. Yeah. And it's not okay for them to take that same story about it, uh, like more judgmental or like analytical stance as long as broader yeah. black societal issues. Well, we're going to get into that because when I talk about this notion of you want to say objectivity, but when you talk about opinions in journalism, you're absolutely allowed to have opinions. I mean, we're encouraged to have opinions. We're encouraged to add it on air. You know, oh, you know, British Science Story. And you can say things that fit with the sort of existing, I guess, status quo that they're that they're defending. The problem is that there's a lot of underlying assumptions and biases, which as university professors, I'm sure uh, none of this is new to you. But um, this is something that uh, that is starting to, I guess, define. Uh, the nature of this kind of accountability work, the expense of longer projects or uh, maybe deeper digging projects that might actually point to some alternatives, some changes. Uh, so why do we do these easy stories? It's because every hour that every cameraman out on T costs money. Every reporter that you pull away from the cat in the tree for two days is a hole that other people have to fill. And every newsroom feels understaffed all the time. And every night it's a minor miracle that you get an hour of television to air. Like it's just, that's the reality. It's like all hands on deck all the time. So if you're a regular reporter, it means you actually have to fight really hard to do investigative work. You have to expend a lot of energy just arguing with your own bosses to be able to do something even for two days or three days like this. Um, so how about, we're talking about the sort of three pillars, I guess, of responsible or, or, uh, or good journalism to moral, moralize. Um, and that was uh, investigative, international, and, and local. So how about international coverage? And there it is, and we have the information about the dress. It is, in fact, Sarah Burton of Alexander McQueen. But there's a lot of Kate Middleton in that dress, I can tell you. So I don't know how much those anchors make, I can guess. Uh, I don't know how much it costs to fly from to London. I don't know how much it costs to rent the satellites per hour, but it's in the $600 an hour range just for the network window. Uh, but I do know that this kind of pre-packaged, stage-managed celebrity uh, reporting is TV gold, right? Because it keeps you on deadline, it keeps you on schedule. It's absolutely worth the investment because there's free spectacle, it's all choreographed, and you have to spend a very set amount of money to get this kind of, I guess, bang for your buck. So that's why every network, of course, left on the chance to do a huge takeout 24 hour, three day special on the wedding, and then again on the visit, because you literally get this map mailed to you where it's like, here's where they're going to walk, and here's where you can set up your cameras. And it's like, it's like no-brainer TV. As for real international coverage, I don't know, I was watching CTV National News last night, and had a Tom Kennedy piece from this like horrible scene in Nairobi where this pipeline had exploded and there's all these burnt kids and stuff, and there's all these dead people in these little teen shacks. And then at the end, there's no stand-up, he just signs off from London. And you realize that he's just reading in a room, it's called making radio, right? It's radio with pictures from other people's networks. And you see this all the time where they talk about the plane crash in Russia and all the dead hockey players. It's just like amateur military video that they've ripped off of YouTube or from another network. And it's literally the cheapest possible way to even mention
commission overseas events and still call what you're making television. But that doesn't mean that, well, the fact is, um, despite all this marketing jargon about news renewal, these, these people are all closing international bureaus, not open, right? So Tom Kennedy is in London, uh, CTV closed Kampala and Moscow. So they've got two reporters in Washington, one in LA, New Delhi, Beijing, and Jerusalem. <coughs> Global has Washington, London, Delhi, and New Delhi for whatever reason. CBC is doing something interesting. They have their partnership with Magic Canada, so they're moving to use bilingual correspondence. Have you noticed this? Watching like XE, they've got the same people on both networks, which saves them a lot of money. Uh, and Sun News doesn't have any overseas bureaus, but they do manage to do a little bit of investigative overseas enterprise journalism. Great ideas come from everywhere, and frankly, folks, kids are kids. So any good ideas we have about looking after the education of our young people, I think it's worth doing. He's also got some thoughts on health care. That'll probably make some of you mad. But anyway, without further ado, I want to send you to our discussion with former Florida Governor Jeb Bush. Governor Bush, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Leo. They occasionally splash out on some international coverage, but... Um yeah, like the time during the, uh, the election campaign when they were doing a story about jacking up gas prices and the NDP policy and cap and trade, and they had these uh, stocks of gas stations with gallons. Anyway, they do accidental foreign coverage, but they're really not that interested in things that are happening outside of their own little brains. So the last category would be local television, um, the community building stuff, and unfortunately, uh, local television is in a fight for its life. I mean, if it hasn't already lost uh, in most markets in Canada, you've got some religious stations in like Hardston, Alberta, and Abbotsford. You've got uh, the Omni multicultural stations in the big cities. You've got a, a shrinking number of, uh, of independents, and the rest of them have been bought up by the big networks. So what you have now is a situation where CTV runs one local newscast for all of Northern Ontario, right? So like Sudbury, Timmins, Wawa's are all watching the same newscast. Or the Maritimes, CTV does the same thing. One local newscast for the Maritimes, and then they'll have reporters popping up from different bureaus in Moncton and, and Newfoundland. Um, and Global, <laughs> well, CBC is a good example. I mean, we used to have to fill these 90 minute newscasts, right? So we'd all be on three times. And the rest of the time, they'd fill it out with syndication. And that's another tool that the networks are using more and more. When they've got these stations, this is why you're watching news in Vancouver, and you suddenly see a story about a, like a three legged dog with a heart of gold in Moncton. That's because they've syndicated that content so they can fill up these monster magnet newscasts. Um, and that brings me to Global, which is maybe the saddest example. Uh, and they, uh, they only have 11 stations nationwide, and all of their operations for some reason are run out of Calgary. So the anchors now just sit in these little rooms, like with no text. I don't think they even have cameramen, because this is a robot. And of course, there's uh, mistakes that happen because all the text in Calgary, so you've got Global Maritimes popping up as a the part of the global material station. But it's kind of meta, right? Because the point I'm making is that they're all uh, um, totally interchangeable, basically. Um, in fact, they do weather hits and stuff where people pretend to give you the local weather when they're on a green screen in another city. So you're not making jobs, you're not covering local events, etc. So if investigative budgets have shrunk, and if local TV is almost dead, and if foreign coverage is being clawed back, I guess the question is what we're watching and how we're filling those 60 minutes or 90 minutes uh, if you're CBC. And the answer is in the form of a kind of green video. Action News, Delaware Valley's leading news program with Gary Papa and Rob Jennings. Saturday night, the weather was picture perfect for a parade in Center City, Philadelphia, and Miss Universe joins the festivities at tonight's Puerto Rican Week banquet at the Franklin Plaza. But the big story in Action News is another breakdown in talks to end Philadelphia's newspapers. So that's not a SCTV joke. That's uh, the legacy of Frank and Maggot. So anytime you're watching this um, accident coverage, uh, health scares, weather stories, uh, entertainment, feel-good stories, anchor chit-chat. All of this was invented and codified and standardized by this guy, uh, Frank Mag. So he's what we call the godfather of local television news, uh, the guy who pioneered this action news format. And I'm not joking about his influence. Like, 
the maggot consultants literally, we call them the maggots, very creative. They would crawl through the hallways of the CDC, uh, telling us how to keep viewers simultaneously anxious and stimulated. They have this like technique they teach anchors to be both relaxed and intense. And literally, these people come up from Marion, Iowa, which is where this guy was based, and they're in every newsroom across the continent and beyond. And this is one consultancy, Frank and Maggot, proved uh, in, in this one market in Delaware that if you can uh, sort of keep people on the edge of their seat and turn it into infotainment, uh, that you will boost your ratings. And of course, you make shitloads of money. So that's very hard to ignore when you're the competition and you've still got Walter Cronkite sitting there. I mean, Cronkite, by the way, called this guy all sorts of names. Uh, the most trusted newsman in America that had no kind words for Frank Maggot because Cronkite was the example that Maggie used of what was wrong with TV journalism. You would just sit there and tell you things that you assumed were true, and then he would show you film, and then he would talk to you more. And so if you want to ask yourself why Peter Mansbridge walks around on set, it's literally because of Maggie. Like, that's what the consultants told us to do. Um, other examples. Why is it being live all the time? Right? Why do you have these whooshing graphics and the tickers that bring facts by that are too quick and they're going in the wrong direction and they're not about the thing that they're talking about. <laughs> also invented by these guys. Um, why do you have two anchors? You know the format with two anchors and then the weather presenter walks in and they banter and they chit chat and they have like 30 seconds to fill time for the next item. Also invented by these guys. I mean everything that's familiar about local television news and it's now seeped into network coverage and it, this is what the national looks like now. Uh, it's all informed by the research and the statistics and psychology that was conducted by these dudes in the 70s. So why does Maggot exist? Why have all the station managers uh, lined up to drink the Kool-Aid? Uh, the easy answer is ratings. And the ratings are important because if you're the CDC, you need to be able to prove to James Moore that you're fulfilling your mandate so that you don't get your federal funding slash. Uh, and if the CDC does this infotainment action news, then there's no pressure on the private networks to do anything remotely credible, right? Because they're not being out journalistic journalisted in their own markets. So there's nothing motivating anybody to do anything that costs more money than necessary to retain that viewership. So it's turned the local TV market into this kind of sick scramble for ratings where they send out congratulatory, self-congratulatory press releases about like a 0.5% bump in the ratings month over month. And that's all they think about. So the people that they now have running these newsrooms are not former journalists. They're bean counters. Um, <clears throat> newscasts are 30 or 60 or 90 minutes long because uh, we've already sold the ad spaces, right? But the problem I have is that uh, not all news days are created equal. So maybe once a decade, uh, you'll have an event like 9-11 where you have to spend the whole weekend in front of TV just to sort of understand the cultural import of what's going on. And then maybe two or three times a year, you know, they'll shoot Osama, or you'll have Hurricane Katrina, or you know, you'll have a wellhead spewing millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf, and that might warrant a full day to sitting in front of the TV. Most days, I think it's debatable whether uh, spending 60 minutes plunk down in front of the TV news is going to make you a better informed citizen and participant in this democracy. So, <clears throat> what they've done is follow out this, this institution. It's literally like taking tiles of a, a Jenga game with job cuts and with the convergence, syndication, consolidation. They've managed to keep the facade looking pretty good. Uh, but the foundations are extremely weak. And you can measure that just by being in a newsroom and realizing how close they are to total crisis and black air, dead air every night. Uh, so as a, as a force for, uh, for maintaining democracy, let alone pointing to positive or progressive social change, uh, I decided that TV news is not a medium that I can put another day of my effort into. But that's not to say that we didn't try. Quebec is being accused of hypocrisy. The province exports asbestos to developing countries while banning the material from buildings here at home. Well, now the prestigious medical journal The Lancet has joined the campaign against Canadian asbestos. And this as the Charest government is considering a major investment to expand production. Kai Nagata reports. The streets in this town are literally paved with asbestos. It's in tar, gravel and all that, and packed in. Réal Bachin and his wife, Colette, are happily retired. 
both spent long careers in Canada's largest open pit mine. This is Asbestos, Quebec. In the 50s, every time a new hole was blasted, the fibers fell like snow over nearby houses. And we used to make balls and throw balls at each other, and like, just like in the wintertime. Both say they're healthy. If I believe the specialist, we should have been dead by six, I should have been dead. And our, our own, our old family should have been dead too. And the whole town should have been dead. It was snowing here. The town is dying in a different way. Ever since medical studies established the link with cancer, demand has withered, and so have jobs. That's what Min Jeffrey Project means for us. Younger people and uh, the time to diversify our economy for the next 25 years. The town is pleading with the Quebec government to guarantee a $58 million loan that would get the mine running full steam. But a delegation has traveled halfway around the world to ask that the mine be shut down completely. Who wrote all asbestos victims are watching you? Please stop to export asbestos from Canada. You can do it. She has terminal cancer, something 82-year-old Paul Dussault just can't wrap his head around. Some guys died, he says, but they were smokers. They lived hard. The mineral itself is safe when properly handled, says part-time miner, part-time lobbyist Serge Boulard. They just have to put a mask, and there is no problem. Just by providing mask, we cannot ensure, you know, that there won't be cases. And, you know, if it's so safe, then why uh, it's not being used here in Canada? The minister says Quebec inspectors could maybe help ensure safety standards overseas. So this is the challenge. That's the reason we have no, we have not taken a decision yet. So do you save a real town right here in Quebec, or do you bank on potentially saving lives overseas? That's the dilemma faced by the Quebec government. People here are hoping for a decision by Christmas. Kai Nagata, CTV News, Asbestos. So journalistically, I call that piece pretty weak. Um, that's one of my favorite stories that we actually had the time to do at CTV. And uh, I don't think it really does any of the things that it needed to do. Um, because what this piece needs is a doctor, right? You need somebody who represents the legions of medical researchers who are unanimous in condemning Canadian exports to take you over to a uh, lab and show you in a microscope what this shit does to human lung tissue, right? And then you need to fly to Southeast Asia and you need to get the footage of the guys in the loincloths lifting this with no protective gear and just throwing like raw fibers into the cement mixer with this bag that says Asbestos Quebec next to the cement mixer. And then you need to go to some worker's home and film him like coughing up blood while his children cry. And then you fly back and you sit down with the Quebec Premier and you ask him how he can possibly make an independent decision about this when he accepted money from a campaign fundraiser organized by the businessman who's trying to reopen the mine. And then you sit down with Stephen Harper and you ask him how he can ignore Chuck Strahl, his former conservative MP, who's among the 10% of mesothelioma patients who survive and is now saying, at least don't block it from going on the hazardous species list. At least, not species, substances. Like, let alone the question about exporting it. Like, just try not to look like an asshole on the global stage. Harper ignores Strahl and then, <laughs> You need to go to France, okay, because there's activists right now organizing a tourism boycott. There are economic implications beyond the jobs in asbestos because they're preparing a campaign right now featuring snow-capped Canadian mountains covered in this hazardous white fiber. Then you go back to asbestos and you ask people what their dream job would be if there was any economy in the town other than this cancer pit. And then you ask them what they could do with $58 million in government loans if they were to put it into any other industry. Right? So that would take two weeks or three weeks. And it would take flights to France and Southeast Asia. Melissa Fung, to her credit, and to the CBC's credit, did actually go to Asia and get that footage of the guys like tossing asbestos fiber. But CTV did because we're a private network and that would make any fiscal sense. So the deal went through. And the PQ backed down, the official opposition backed down because they have strong ties from the unions that wanted those jobs in that town. And so rather than looking at any kind of alternative solution, they are going to now sink $58 million with this loan guarantee and reopen the mine. And another generation of workers in Quebec is going to go down. And luckily they have, you know, 
space age protective gear, so they're probably going to survive, kind of like their grandfathers. But the people in Southeast Asia are not going to be helped by having like two Quebec government inspectors fly over there once a year and say, "Are you wearing masks?" So I was also working for CTV. Um, I don't know if this is something controversial to say to you, Vic, but. Uh, Senator Mike Duffy and Senator Pamela Wallen are both former CTV broadcasters, now appointed by the Conservatives to the Senate. Um, you saw that spectacle at the beginning of the annual exclusive sit-down interview with Robert Fife and Lloyd, uh, where the Prime Minister sits down with them because they're a friendly broadcaster. Um, but this is hypothetical. I mean, the point is I never got close enough. Like, I never got to a point where I could have hammered on the Quebec government or the federal government hard enough for them to tell me to stop. I say the Quebec government because the official opposition at the time was the PQ, and the one political opinion that you are allowed to express, and this gets back to the point you were making earlier about where you draw that line, um, everyone from Lloyd down to the mailroom clerk is allowed to hate on separatists. I mean, in his goodbye letter, Lloyd talks about, oh, the referendum, mm, 95. And you can totally rip the PQ on air if you want to. You can scowl and you can send all sorts of non-verbal views about the figure of Quebec, but you have to be fair. You can just say whatever you want, basically, off air more than on air about separatists. So don't hammer the Quebec liberals too much, right? Anyway, that's hypothetical. I never got in a position to find out. And the point is, I didn't want to stay and become, I didn't want to see Terry Malevsky on the campaign trail. I mean, kudos to him, but he's not a happy person. Like, it was great watching him get up there because there were like four questions a day. And so Malesky would go up and he would ask like a three minute question, which just had everything in it. And then these conservative uh, supporters of the rally would be like, shut down the CBC! <laughs> Malesky would just keep yelling, answer the question, answer the question. I would be like, mm, that's completely untrue. So <laughs> I didn't want to be that guy, right? I decided that I could do uh, more with my time and energy, I guess, um, by sitting outside of that system. And that's a personal decision that um, you can agree with or not agree with, but. I'm way, way happier uh, right now. Um, so I don't have deadlines anymore. But the cool thing is that I do have these uh, these skills in this training, right? Like, uh, I didn't get to do it at CTV, but I'm a trained video journalist. Like, I can call and navigate and drive and shoot and edit and report and write in the same day, right? That's one of the things they taught us at the CBC. Um, radio skills, whatever. I've got a blog. I've got a Twitter account. I've got an iPhone. I forward a laptop from the TIE. I've got a pick up truck, it's half big down. Uh, so I have resources, right? And I have this network of people, which I think is far more important. And that's not just the people who are still inside these organizations, but all the people that I was talking about earlier, who have all these different backgrounds, who aren't necessarily journalists, but who might be in academia or activism or, sure, the union movement, or they might be economists, or they might be freelance photographers, or whatever. There's people out there who, I think, their instincts probably meshed with the ones that I ignored going in, and so they've never walked into this system. And then there's also people who are on the inside who I know are this close to quitting because they got in touch to say, oh man, if I didn't have a mortgage to pay, I'd go out the door with you and go to documentaries. So I'm totally committed to continuing my work. Um, the question is what form that's going to take. And so that's what I'm looking for right now, is the blueprint. And that is why I'm doing this little tour, this is why I'm here, and this is what I want to ask you, is what you want out of Canadian journalism. Because you all nodded when you said, yeah, TV news could be better. And you all nodded when I said, there are, there are stories for which visual journalism works best. And we have people with skills, and we have resources, and we have networks. We don't have a lot of money, but there might be an alternative model out there. And there are people who are working on that right now, and that's what I've started to do basically is to go into the lab and try to come up with these models. And I'm going to be running these experiments over the next, could be 20 years, I don't know. But I've got a couple of doc projects lined up this fall, and I'm experimenting with like zero budget journalism that is totally free to consume and share, that you can <coughs> produce from a laptop in the desert and upload over a 3G connection and get in people's hands. The question is, how can we leverage uh, the free technology, and how can we piggyback off of the existing networks and the infrastructure that they have, which is massive, and the workforces that they still have. I mean, if you can piggyback off of those existing networks as sort of booster rockets to get these stories out there, 
Uh, that's incredibly powerful. So these are all questions that I'm trying to answer right now. And I have a few clues, and I have a little bit of theory. And aside from that, it's completely trial and error. So if you guys have any questions, uh, or even better, if you have ideas that you want to share, uh, I'm done talking. So let me turn it over to you. Yeah. I have a question. Um, most of the TV news I watch, I watch in a hotel room in Europe or Asia or someplace where I'm traveling. And I watch CNN. And it's completely different. In CNN in Europe, you can't believe you're watching the same network you're watching in North America. And a lot of these, these uh, maggot uh, tactics of, that you show here are, aren't used there. And you see stories, incisive uh, analysis of, 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 of events in the world that just you would not see North America. Now, I get one, you agree that there's that difference. But two, if you do, how do you account for it? Is the market, is it, is it just a different market assessment that the, that the European, uh, the Asian <coughs> markets both don't respond to the same kind of tactics and don't expect the same kind of uh, uh, attitude towards it? What's, what's going on? There's a couple of factors there. Uh, Canada and the U.S. are the G8 nations with the lowest per, fund per capital funding for public broadcasting. So if you're watching in any market, uh, you know, whether it's a Japanese network or a British network, um, what I described, that phenomenon of the public broadcasters sort of keeping the private networks honest, is I think very much in operation. I haven't watched a ton of French TV news or, um, you know, I haven't so the French really loves all the right? They do. Totally. But you have these examples, right? You have Al Jazeera, which was uh, the, the English branch was managed by Tony Berman, who's the former executive producer at CBC, and he came to this and went over to Qatar. <coughs> and they have all this money from the government there in Qatar. So I don't know what strings that comes with, and I haven't seen a lot of pieces explaining their relationship uh, and their editorial relationship, I guess, to the, the sheik or whoever runs the... Um, the money into things. Um, but the point is that when you have these institutions out there, it has an effect on the other networks in the same environment, the same sphere. And so when you're in a country like Canada where, I don't know, it's like $30 a person for French and English services and 27 Aboriginal languages or something, when we're spread out like that, uh, you can make arguments about a big country and infrastructure and telecom, but the point is that when the CBC is as underfunded as it is, and I think that at $1.1 .1 billion, it's underfunded. Um, and when they pour their money into these like royal coverage specials and stuff, I think it's a misallocation of resources that comes from sort of chasing the private networks down this rabbit hole. Um, the other factors could well be cultural, um, and that's something that I'm not really qualified to, to examine, but I think that um, in Canada and the States, we have embraced a kind of polarization and simplification and dumbing down of our news culture. I don't know whether that's entirely economic in nature, whether the basis for it is just sort of free market economics, or whether it's uh, something cultural. But those are questions that are top of mind, for sure. Dr. Cooper, did you want to have a response or something? Any questions? Yeah, that was such a great talk.
Secondly, there's nothing not only to counter, but also feeds into the, the celebrity culture, desires for fascination. Mm -hmm. And in any case, media system comes with a lot of different things mm -hmm. and it really draws in the presence of it. A real fascination is celebrity scam. It affects you higher in the most basic sense. There are other factors that become more important than the analytical capacities. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, first of all, what you talked about, um, the, the very uh, hindrance of having to have the pictures to tell the story is a huge one. And so what these big traditional television networks have done is graph on basically these sort of like social media departments so to try to show that they're engaged and hip. And so, uh, this is like this double-edged sword, right? Because they love to have a tweet so much, and then I get these calls being like, take that off work. And that actually happened many times, right? Because despite the corporate disclaimer, I'm still speaking as a spokesperson for CTV, and so there's a certain sort of uh, expectation that you maintain that neutrality, and, uh, and that you don't question the fundamental, I guess, economic models that underlie the business itself, and that you don't talk too much about how decisions are made. And one of the incidents that really caused friction um, with my uh, managers was a story about the CP care fund um, being barred from the National Assembly. And we had this exclusive footage, because that was like one of the scoops that we got at the uh, National Assembly. We had a camera in the security area filming these people being patted down and rejected from the National Assembly. And once I put that out on Twitter, and it kind of blew up, and all these Western Canadian media outlets and ROC media that started calling the World Seek Organization and freaking out, uh, the people at the National Assembly realized that they had an optics problem. So they sent this very slick uh, communicator up to my bureau in the press gallery, which is technically sovereign territory, to tell me you can't run that footage. So I took that back to my bosses and said, listen, we have a relationship to maintain with the institution that we're actually covering. I think we need to be careful about how far we push them, but at the same time, I think this is really innocuous footage that we're showing, and it's really good because it's, it's we have the pictures. We so often try to tell the story without the pictures and use boards and phone clips and shit like this, and we're actually sitting on this great visual material. And so on Twitter, I just described how we decided that the, on balance, that the relationship with the National Assembly was more important than this hot scoop and this good video. And just the fact that I talked like shop talk on Twitter just got them, like their heads just exploded and had to delete the whole chain of tweets. Uh, so they love social media, but only if it carries this logo and a corporate disclaimer, and if you're the same person on social media that you are on TV. And so I agree that uh, they're just getting whacked by, you know, these bloggers in Libya, right? There's people who, um, who are providing content, whether they have journalistic training or not. Uh, you get to see the stuff that the networks literally aren't going to show you, right? You can talk all you want over like a still picture of Gaddafi about human rights abuses or about NSD accusing the, the rebels of you know, executing black guys that they come across in Libya, but until you see that on YouTube, it doesn't really hit home. So there's people who are actually doing visual journalism more powerfully uh, and who I think in many cases have more authority to tell those stories than trained journalists who come over from Canada and live in a hotel and walk around in a tight t-shirt talking about this revolution, right? So, <clears throat> um, the argument that the networks are going to bring into it, and I'm in this debate right now with this guy Tim Knight, who is one of the, he's the former executive producer of CBC News, and he is uh, also upset with the sort of state of journalism, but his belief is that we need like an insurrection within the institution, and so we're in this debate right now uh, on the mark which I encourage you to check out if this kind of stuff interests you. And, and he brings up this institutional argument that you need these neutral centers from which to tell the story. And basically, it's, it's like the clergy argument. It's like, there are some people who are qualified to interpret events, and you are not. So we are gonna train these neutral, objective sort of centers to gather information like an octopus and then regurgitate this like shining pillar of objectivity that will tell you all you need to know and nothing more. Um, because, you know, you can't handle the truth. And if you were actually to go and look at all these blogs, you might emerge confused and you would stray into conspiracy theories and you would confirm beliefs that you already have. You would only look at, you know, you only want to go look into the things that, that you're interested in. And that, that might be true, but it's also all true about the TV news industry, too. 
So it's the institutional argument is brought up as a sort of self-defense, which is that we have to have these professional journalists. And so right now, the Quebec government is actually looking at a, a proposed bill that would create a registry of professional journalists. And so people like me, now that have walked away from that institution, no longer qualify and have less access to ministers and don't get their emails answered because they're just bloggers, right? Whereas these institutions uh, are clearly far more legitimate gatekeepers of uh, public information. And the other point that just brings me back to the question that the gentleman posed about international coverage and institutions that are doing a good job um, is that I totally didn't mention uh, Edu Canada, which is, we all pay for it, and it's excellent, excellent journalism. And they're the only force sort of keeping journalism in Quebec on us right now. Uh, then the, uh, the investigative guys at uh, Jessica, uh, which is like about press and these big French papers. So the actual culture of journalism, I would say, is way uh, stronger in, in Quebec uh, than it has become in the rest of Canada in terms of creating and producing and cultivating these people who mentor each other and can do like this amazing investigative work over a 30 year career and put up all this work, uh, become real experts in their, their chosen fields. Uh, that's a form of journalism that's dying, but Edu Canada is doing the best to sort of keep it alive with the funding that we have. And there's a huge difference if you watch them and their main competitor, which is the, the guys that are writing about right now from the Tahiti category. When you just look at the quality and how Edu Canada does its best to sort of stay above the, uh, the fray, it makes them kind of irrelevant, which is sad, but the journalism that they're making is still, uh, is still very, very good. And I put it on a level with these other outlets, public broadcasters, and Um, did that sort of answer some of your questions? I mean, this is the big problem now, is the legitimacy, right? Like, I'm going around, uh, you know, asking people to believe in a model that I haven't tested yet, and to, like, I'm actually trying to get, uh, trying to crowdsource some funding for this documentary, but I can't talk about the subject because it's an awesome story, and I'm now competing against all of these networks. I mean, in Southern California, LA has this, like, dazzling constellation of media outlets that would love to do this story but don't know about it. So we have this exclusive story, we're trying to put this doc together, but it's really hard to say, it's gonna be online, it's gonna be free, it's gonna be secret, it's gonna be awesome. Because uh, people are just like, okay, well, show me going on. Right? So uh, I think if it's successful, I think that if we can make it work, that it'll provide a model to sort of build on and work on. But this is like all just us stumbling around in the dark. This is like me and some friends who come from journalism and other people who come from the film world and, uh, and academia who are, who are basically building these very simple models and we're about to test them. But um, I'm actually doing this kind of lecture tour a little bit prematurely because I really want to be able to come back and say, here's an alternative, here's something that we're making work, uh, and here's what they're producing. Now you actually have a choice of about what to watch. That's something that I'm not in a position to do yet, so my apologies. Yeah? Um, I'm just sort of thinking about your question about like what, what do you want from the Canadian journalism? Yes, please. And I'm um, not, <laughs> not going to offer too, too much insight, but um, I think from a like, federal government background. And so I guess my question is how do we like bridge past this like intense micromanaging and um, you know, like just this, this intense level that like the Harvard government has been in terms of um, in terms of you know press releases and media lines and all these things. Like, how do we kind of break past that and have actual conversations with our elected officials? Like, that's what I want from the journalists. Can I interrupt here for a second? I worked with C Max for a while, and, and uh, I was uh, <clears throat> as a producer, and so uh, a lot of the times I, I like I knew Jack Layton, I knew Mike Nadia, and it was all. Uh, it was all very scripted, all very sound bite. And there's a couple of instances where, where I had a three hour talk show on the weekend. And so it was the one time where I had to talk about things on a, on a human level. So we talked, when we interviewed Michael McNadia, when he came out here, he didn't know anything about the West Coast. So we had to bring in Keith Martin and have him kind of uh, fill in the blanks and some car scene that we and talk with him. It was, uh, it was either sound bites or he didn't know anything. And it was, it was Bizarre to see, but it became a very real conversation. We ended up talking about piercings in the 80s versus kids with metal on their face nowadays. And it, it was odd, and we talked about the real issues. It either did know or they weren't really doing anything about it. Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the 
if I can get back to this problematic <coughs> micromanagement of the media line, the muzzling, um, the climate of fear in the public service, uh, and the consequences, the punishment for leaked data, information getting out means heads roll, right? Everybody knows this, and everybody operates under this kind of ingrained belief that if you're loyal to the government that's in service now, eventually there will be a changing of the guard, and you don't want to sort of alienate other players. And I don't know, there's just this sort of feeling that if you just ride it out, if you just stick it out, that things will get better. But there are uh, irreversible changes occurring in these institutional cultures. And this is something that I'm trying to explore a little bit more in my writing, which now becomes sort of like my, my, my day job is to write for the and I'm literally just putting the grant money into this crazy doc and going down to California for two months and just writing more, but doing interviews with people in the public service, in the universities, uh, clergy. Because there's all these institutions that I think traditionally um, have served as the kind of engines of what I call the public conversation, uh, which are in this kind of paralyzed state right now. There's this kind of fear. And I would say that a lot of it, again, is economic. And when you look at the, when I describe TV newsrooms and how they're, they've been gutted, right? And everyone's just scared of losing their jobs. And you know, like if you if you compare it to the states, 20% of journalists in the states have lost their jobs since 2008. So the people who are re who are remaining in these newsrooms, they know that they're expendable and replaceable, and that there are freelancers who will gladly swoop in. And that's the people who have real jobs. I had a real job, so I was able to sort of get a little sassy with management. But, you know, I had a union back. Most people my age in these institutions are stringers, they're freelancers, right? And so when you start, this is, this is an economic model that is consistent across all of these institutions where you bring people in as interns, you make them feel grateful for having the work that they do have, and then <coughs> you make their promotion commensurate with the degree to which I guess they're able to sort of drink the Kool Aid and adhere to the institutional culture. Are we? Oh, we're out here. So I think it's a problem that goes beyond the public service. I think that you can't fix it in one institution alone, but the key is still individual people, right? And as long as individual people are scared of losing their jobs because they have mortgages to pay, or they're scared of, of not following the marching orders despite their own personal convictions, then you're going to have these paralyzed institutions that I think are much more similar than we realize. Until there's a dialogue between people who are, for example, watching tenure numbers drop on campuses and the rise of sessional faculty and contract-based teaching jobs, the importance of publication as opposed to teaching, this idea that you have to produce, 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 and this idea that you're constantly under this sort of regime of austerity that eventually, hopefully, will get better, I think is a lie. I think it's become a new reality from what I've seen inside the public broadcast or the private network. And so I think that it's until we start talking between the universities and the newsrooms, between the churches who are trying to manage their property across the country, and the military, the police forces, they're all dealing with the same problems right now in different forms. And I think that's why this dialogue is so important between these institutions. Anyway, thank you so much. For and if you do know any rich angel investors, send them to my blog. It's very easy.